Amen and amen. Let's pray. Avinu Mulkin, our Father, uh, our King, we again just thank you so much that we can come together in this dark time when many love darkness more than light. Father, there's always a remnant that loves the light and they want to run to it. And we just want to run toward you in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A couple of quick uh, more announcements. First off, is there anyone here who is here for the very first time this morning? Raise your hand. We just have something we want to give you. If there's anyone here for the very first time, I don't see any. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to mention, I have some very exciting news. Are you ready? I hope the live stream people are ready. We're going to start a podcast that is going to be like on every Spotify, I mean, everything you can even think of. And it's going to start March 5th at three in the afternoon. And what is going to be uh, for the whole year, okay, that we're starting this, uh, basically going to be about end times and current events from a biblical perspective. So we're going to be looking uh, about tying together what's happening right now kind of like what Kai Meissen was saying, and it's fulfilling prophecy right now. So it's going to be exciting to look at the current events and end times from a biblical perspective to tie it all together. So uh, Bill Voice, the vice president of LCDI ministry, and I are launching this, and we're very excited because of the times that we're living in, we really think we're going to reach a whole lot of people. And so be uh, praying about this for us, uh, lift us up, and uh, tune in March 5th, 3 p.m. as we launch this podcast. Uh, I, I'm so excited about this. I really am. I'm, we're, we've already got one podcast done. We're pre-taping them. I got three more I want to get done uh, in the next couple of weeks so we can launch it because you, you need to have at least four podcast tape ready to go. But I think this is going to be off the charts because so many people are trying to connect what's going on in the world with biblical events. A lot of people know we're living in the, what's called the end times. But uh, I'm, I'm going to bring out a perspective that I don't know of too many other podcasts that are doing this. So keep us in prayer. Okay, so now we are on the tour portion today called Mishpatim. Now I have the word in Hebrew on those scales. And what does Mishpatim mean? Judgments. That's exactly what it means. Now, as Kai Meissen said, it basically every Hebrew word has like a two or three letter root word. And so right there, shafat, the shin, the pay, and the tet is the main root word for that. And what do we find? Shafat means to, uh, is a judge. That's what it is, a judge. And then if you add the Yud Mem at the end, you get our Torah portion, uh, or Judges, and you put Mishpatim, which is our complete Torah portion, you get Judgments. But you can see the word Shafat, uh, you know, is part of every one of those. So uh, as you're learning Hebrew, you're going to find once you can know the three-letter root word, you can have a good idea of what uh, you're talking about. Now, the interesting thing about a judge... When you look at the ancient Hebrew, we're going to take a look at that. There is how Moses would have written it. He had different font, just like on your computer, you have different font. Well, the shin kind of looks similar. It's like our W, but what it really is, is fangs, teeth. And the shin means to consume, to destroy. And then the fe or the pay, what that is, you can see it looks like this, kind of. It's like a mouth, and it means mouth. That's what the, the word meaning is. And then the tet, you can see a circle with an X in it, and it represents a serpent. So the judge is the one who destroys the mouth of the serpent. Isn't that fascinating when you look at that? He's the one that says, shut your mouth. Now, as we're talking about judgments, there are different English words and there are different Hebrew words. I don't know where I heard this, but in Alaska, they have like 80 words for snow. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's very detailed. Well, when it comes to the Bible, we need to understand there's basically four type of commandments. So we use the word commandment, and in Hebrew, the word is mitzvah, and I have it spelled a mitzvah, that's for singular, a commandment. And then we have the plural, well, there's more than one. Well, we add an S to a word, uh, they add the tav, so mitzvah becomes mitzvot. And then I have it in Hebrew under the word plural, mitzvot. So when you talk about mitzvah here or a mitzvot uh, at El Shaddai, we're talking about the basic commandments, all right? The 613. But within those, there are also judgments that we're gonna be talking about today or an ordinance. Now, how many have heard of ordinances? How many of you have violated an ordinance and got a ticket? Okay, well, uh, there we see the word is mishpat or mishpatim uh, in the plural. So you can see there's uh, a judgment and judgments. Then there's what's called a statute in the Bible, but that is a chuk or a chukah. There's a masculine and feminine form uh, and it's our chukot and chukim in the plural. And then there's law or instruction, which is the word Torah. And in plural, it would be Torah. So when people say, oh, the Torah is done away with, okay, well, what about the statutes and the judgments and the commandments? And uh, people don't know they lump everything together. As a matter of fact, there really aren't any commandments in Genesis, but Genesis is a part of the Torah. And yet we also find that Abraham knew the Torah it says. Now, how in the world could Abraham know the Torah a couple, three, four hundred years before the Torah was given as far as we know on Mount Sinai? It's because as Christians, we don't really understand what was going on oftentimes. But I just wanted to point this out that there are different Hebrew words. And, you know, what are the differences between all of these? This is what we have to know. The statutes in particular, uh, one of the statutes would be the ashes of the red heifer. That would be a, considered a statute. Statutes are those where God just says, I told you so. You ever have the parents tell you, you just do it because I said so. I'm not going to explain it to you. Well, that is what a statute is. Uh, and they say Moses, uh, not Moses, Solomon couldn't even figure out the statute for the red heifer. What was the reason behind it? I mean, in one sense, it, uh, it sounds weird because the person has to be clean who puts it on the unclean person and the unclean person becomes clean, but the clean person becomes unclean by putting it on the unclean person. And it's like, what is going on here? How does this work? Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to set that out. Now, concerning the judgments, the mishpatim of God, one thing that has been said is that it's not just enough to teach the Torah because if you look at Exodus 21.1, the beginning verse of our Torah portion, what does it say? Now, these are the mishpatim, the judgments. He's talking to Moses, which you shall do what? Set before them. Okay, what comes to your mind when he's setting them before them? Well, it is said you need to present it to your children and to one another like a set table. It's not just say, here's all the commandments, here's the big list, but no, you're going over the appetizer and the main course and the dessert and all these things are to be set before them as something that is wonderful that they want to partake in. And uh, for example, here you go and it's uh, Passover and then you bring, here is your Torah with all the commandments and everything in it. Uh, instead of hating law, we need to love it because we know it's for our good. When you lay down the law as a parent to your kid, are you doing that because you're an evil parent? Or are you doing that because you love your kids? So what needs to change is our relationship. Now, here's what I want to, you to think about. Uh, how many of you know some states have some horrible laws? When you hear about a state I mean, they're so woke anymore and there's so much evil that's going on and it's called a civil law. What does that tell you about that government in that state? Hmm, I have to decide, do I wanna live in that state or in another state? 
All right, we kind of look at the laws because the laws tell you about the lawgiver. So when we need uh, to look at these commandments in the Torah, instead of just tossing them all in the garbage, we need to really look at them and say, what is this law telling me about the lawgiver? That's how we have to look at this. Wow, God wants us to take care of the widows. He wants us to take care of the orphans. You know, he wants us to take care of the poor. So what is that telling us about God? He loves, he cares. And so when we realize every single law of the 613 commandments is actually a piece of godliness and it's a revelation of the law giver. So more than just rules for governing human behavior, the law is really a reflection of the lawgiver. With that in mind, we have to realize the law is God's self-disclosure to the world. Who is God? Tell me about you. And so what does God do? He writes down, here's, here's what I'm like. Here's who I am. This is his self-disclosure to the world. And so when this is realized, we see the enormous gravity of declaring the Torah now null and void. Because when we study the commandments, it's the very study of God himself. When we begin to discard the commandments, we have become God's superior and feel we have the authority to edit his work. That's, that is pretty heavy. We begin to take on Satan's role of has God really said that? Or is that what he really means? So we've begun a process of reshaping God into our image that we deem is more appropriate. When we try to edit Torah or do away with the commandments, it's actually God who we are trying to edit and change or do away with. You saw the image in the announcements of, of a dozen different pictures of Jesus. We've got Hispanic Jesus. We have, you know, African-American Jesus, white Jesus, uh, you, know, you name it, Chinese Jesus. Every one of those are us trying to create God in our image we're not realizing that all of us are created in his image. When you look at your neighbor, you need to realize, wow, there's a reflection of God in you. When I look at you, I see a reflection of God. Wow, I mean, this is how our perspective needs to change when we see people. And look at Genesis 26, five, because Abraham, okay, now Abraham is several hundred years before Moses, guys. And it says, Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes, my laws. Wow, this was several hundred years before Moses. He knew God's laws. Matter of fact, Adam and Eve knew God's laws. Does that sound unbelievable? They had to because God would not allow unclean food to be offered. They knew the unclean food. Uh, laws way back then. The unclean, which animals God would not accept or which animals he would accept. So now let's uh, look at Deuteronomy 8.1 for a second. It says, now I have it twice on your notes. I want you to look at the first one. In Deuteronomy 8.1, I believe is the King James Version. And it says, all the commandments which I command you this day, you shall observe to do that you can live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. Wow, well, you know what? This is one thing. Why in the world would we want to do away with the commandments? If we observe them, we live, we multiply, we go in, we possess the land. You know, so how, why would you think getting rid of them all is going to enable you to do that? It won't. But look at this in the JPS Bible. Now, that's the Jewish Publication Society. Who do you think knows Hebrew better? Do you think King James knew it better than the Hebrews? Look at what it says. All the what? It doesn't say commandments. It says commandment. 
which I command you this day, so you observe to do, that you may live and multiply, go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. Okay, I have the Hebrew up here for you, Genesis 26, 5, where uh, Abraham kept, God says, my commandments. And I want you to notice commandments is plural, which is why... Uh, what I typed in here, you see the mem, the tzade, the vav, and the tav. And then at the very top in that square, you see those same letters with the letter yud at the end. And that makes it my commandments, okay, rather than his commandments, their commandments. But I wanted you to notice in that word up at the top in the box where it says my commandments, you'll notice it ends in the T, which is plural, correct? That's what we just went over a little bit ago. But look at Deuteronomy 8.1 in Hebrew. Here it is mitzvah, and you can see it says the letter hey is in front, and that's the word the, the commandment, and you see the word mitzvah. So your King James English translation is completely wrong. But the problem is here it is in the plural, and yet... At the same time, it's in the singular. If you'll notice in that square on the bottom, you have the kaf and the lamed uh, that we've gone through. And in that square, far right, you see the kaf and the lamed, and that's kol. And guess what? Kol means all. Well, so that means that's plural. But why is the Hebrew word mitzvah then and not mitzvot? So here you have like the, a prefix that generates this, these are all, and yet it ends up with one singular commandment. It is because everything comes under the one commandment, which tells you, you cannot separate the civil laws from the religious laws. You can't say, well, we're only going to obey what, the fa- uh, what Jesus said. We're not going to do what the father said, or we don't follow the 613. We may follow the 10 commandments, but we're not going to follow anything else because you, sep- you can separate them. Well, guess what? The chamber of the hewn stone where the great Sanhedrin judged was on the Temple Mount. So here they try to separate church and state, but God's way is it's there together. And so you can't separate the civil laws from the religious law. And let me tell you the most important reason why. When you as Christians believe you can separate the civil law from the religious law in the Torah, you've just decided that you can determine what is civilly acceptable. All the wokeism, all the wokeism, the abortion, all of these things that are going on is only acceptable if you pull the civil law from the Torah. I mean, think about that. If you pull them apart and separate them, the civil laws have no religious basis. God's not a part of it. Why can't we legalize prostitution? Why can't we legalize drugs? Why can't we? Because you don't have no God behind your civil laws. See, and this is where the church needs to understand you can't separate the civil law from the religious law of the Bible. And if they go, well, we're only going to do what Jesus told us to do. Well, I can show you the verse where Jesus says, I only do what the Father told me to do. So, but this is so important. You can't, so many Christians try to separate the civil from the religious. It's like a quilt. You can't be pulling threads out or you're not going to end up with a quilt. Now, we're going to look at this. Mishpah team, we're going to look at this more carefully so you really understand Okay, let's go uh, to Exodus uh, 12 for just a minute. This is concerning uh, Passover. And then we're going to jump back into the Torah portion. But it says, I want you to observe Passover for an ordinance to you and to your sons for how long? And it'll happen when you've come to the land which the Lord your God will give you according as he promised that you will keep this service. And it will happen when your children ask you, what do you mean by this service? Well, in one sense here, they see it as a burden. What a burden. Why do you have to do this? What's the meaning of all of this? Okay, so 
this is what you're to say. It's the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the household of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. And so we have to understand that civil laws when read that our civil laws are determined always by the Torah, not by what we think should be acceptable. Now, to our Torah portion, look at Exodus 21, 16. Whoever steals or kidnaps someone and sells them. Hello, what about human trafficking? Human trafficking is a huge issue right now. I mean, there's some major cities that are involved, but it is everywhere. Believe me, it is everywhere. And it says, whoever kidnaps someone and sells them and anyone found in possession of that one is to what? Put to death. Verse 18 and 19. If you're in a fight and someone gives another one, hits them in the head with a rock or with a fist, but it doesn't cause him to die, but he has to go to bed for a while or the hospital, if he's able to get up and go about with a cane or a stick, The other will be left off. Only he will have to give him payment for the loss of his time and see that he's cared for till he is well. Wow. If you get in a fight with somebody, you and, you know, he doesn't die. You're not a murderer. But guess what? You got to go take care of his medical bills. Well, that's done away with. That's the tour. That's done away with. I don't have to do that anymore. Sounds pretty dumb. Okay, why would the Bible tell us that this person must pay the medical bills if we weren't meant to only rely upon God and not go to a doctor? That's the other thing. Sometimes Christians feel like I'm not gonna go to the doctor, I'm gonna depend on God to heal me. But we need sometimes, and of course it depends on the doctor. I mean, I've had some crazy ones uh, that almost killed me. Have you guys heard that story? When the doctor almost killed me? You haven't heard this story? I think you have, you may have forgot. I'll tell you real quick. I mean, I believe in going to the doctor, but you gotta go to the right doctor. I was in a major car accident three weeks before our wedding. I was driving at four in the morning. I had a newspaper route. This was back when I was 19 and our 20, 19 to 21 in there. So I have all these papers because I not only threw my own paper out, I was the one who dropped off all the papers for the other carriers. So I've got this van and loaded with papers. I've dropped off everyone else's so they could run their route. Now I'm running my route and I'm not buckled in. I know that's bad, but if you have a paper out, you realize you don't want to be buckled in. Uh, because I have all these bundles. I'm trying to drive, unsnap the bundle thing that bundles them together. Then I have to turn and grab each paper, roll it up, put a rubber band around it, and throw it out the window while I'm going 40 miles an hour. Okay, so I am, I am just going crazy. So it's four in the morning, and it's like 167, where you have two lanes this way, a big ditch, and two lanes going the other way. And I fall asleep. And I'm going about 60 miles an hour, not buckled in. And it was right after July 4th. Stupidly, I went to the July 4th fireworks at night rather than getting my nap. So here I am, and I'm going down the road, and all of a sudden I hear the rumble strips that they have, you know, kind of let you know you're falling asleep. And I wake up, and I see a speed limit sign coming right at me. And so I turned the steering wheel real hard to go out of the way and I turn it so hard and I'm going so fast, I'm headed for the ditch. So I'm, I'm like this and then this, and then I, go, I gotta go the other way. So then I turn it the other way and I'm going back this way and I'm sideways. Okay, here's the highway and my van is sideways and I roll and I flip and I flip and I flip and I flip and land upside down in the ditch I traveled over the length of a football field, 100 yards, just flipping and flipping and flipping 30 yards each time, flipping 30 yards, 30 yards. I'm not buckled in. I wake up and I smell gas. And I got all these newspapers behind me. And it's like, get me out of here. And here you have the hood of the car with the engine and up here's the top of the car. It was almost level with this. I had to crawl out the passenger window to get out. And I'm looking around, hey, I'm fine. My ankle hurt a little bit. 
I didn't get hurt. This is a miracle. God protected me the whole time. I'm flipping and flipping and flipping and flipping. And I go to this farmer's house at four in the morning and I knock on the door. They kind of come to the door looking. I go, hey, I had a wreck. Uh, so they let me call my parents. And so my parents came out to pick me up. So what did I do? I wanted to be a good person and a good employee. So what do I do? I, first off, I clear the entire highway of my windshield and battery and get all the glass off the highway. And then my parents arrive and I unload my van of all the papers, put them in my mom and dad's car. We drive around, I finish throwing all the papers. And then I go home and go to bed. And then about eight in the morning, I get a call from the police. Is this your car out here in the ditch? Yes. Would you come out here? Yes. So I borrow my parents' car. I go back out there and the policeman goes, how fast were you going? I saw where you first hit the track marks and I see where you landed. You traveled the length of the football field. How, how fast were you going? I go, I don't know. I went to sleep. You know, how am I supposed to know? So he says, well, I'm going to write you a ticket for speeding. So he writes me a ticket for speeding. This is like four hours later. And I said, shall I just lay here on the street and wait for you? He said, no, you should have called me first. Uh, then he wrote me another ticket for leaving the scene of an accident. And I was like, hey, I cleared the highway. I had a good lawyer, got me out of both. But the only thing I, that was hurt was my left ankle. Now, this is three weeks before our wedding. And I go to my home doctor in a small town of 800 people. And they x-ray it and say, it's just sprained. You really did good. This whole bad accident, you only sprained your ankle. So they put a nice bandage on it. The doctor did. Small town, 800 people. Well, my mother-in-law-to-be said, oh, he's a quack. You need to go to the big city hospital in Wichita. Okay, so I go to the big city hospital. They take my ACE bandage off. They look at it and they go, uh, you need to have a cast. We x-rayed it. It's not broken. Your doctor was right. But we think it's so badly sprained it needs to have a cast on it. And I'm looking at it and I go, well, how come it's so puffy? Oh, your ACE bandage was too tight. And so they put the cast on. But my foot actually was infected and now I have infection going all through my bloodstream. And it had this nice white, pretty cast on. Everything looked great. And so I am ready to die. It's a week before our wedding now. And I go back to the hospital. I couldn't work. Someone else had to throw the paper out. I, could, I couldn't function. I had a 105 degree temperature. I go back to the hospital, this big city hospital, and I say, get this cast off of me, it's killing me. And they said, no, you just never had a cast before, you're not used to it. I said, what about the 105 degree fever? They said, oh, you got malaria, gave me quinine and sent me home. It is now the day before our wedding. I cannot take it anymore, I go back to my home doctor, he didn't want to take the cast off because this other doctor put it on. I said, can you cut it and make sure everything's okay? All right. So he cuts it open. It's all black and blue and gangrene. And he said I would have died the next day on my wedding day if he hadn't got the infection out. So I know there's good doctors and I know there's bad doctors. But I think the Bible is also telling us, though, that there's nothing wrong with seeing doctors. Okay. Exodus 21, 33 to 36. If a man opens a pit, and the man digs a pit and he doesn't cover the pit and an ox or a donkey falls in there. The owner of the pit has to make it good and give money to the owner and the dead beast will be his. But if a man's ox hurt another's that he die, then he shall sell the live ox, divide the money and the dead ox they'll divide. Or if it be known that the ox is used to push in times past and the owner has not kept him in, he will surely pay ox for an ox and the dead shall be his own. Do we see what God is doing here? He's trying to make things equal, make things fair. People don't take advantage of each other. We see that, I mean, this is how you know that the Torah was God given. Mankind would not write something like this. They wouldn't. And so uh, I think it's amazing that God in the Torah, in the commandments is telling us how to behave. The 10 commandments don't mention anything about how you should treat someone. Okay, Exodus 22, one. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he has to restore five oxen and four sheep. Do you realize how important that is? My goodness, think about it. Do you realize how many fewer thieves we'd have in the world 
if when they got caught, they had to pay fourfold for what they took rather than just throwing them in a prison that we have to pay for and everything else and they just get worse, why don't we do what the Bible says? I had a lady, I used to manage shoe stores and this lady, I caught her shoplifting. I was in a real bad shoplifting area. And we had seven of our pay less shoe store, volume shoe stores in the city, Wichita, Kansas. And I caught the lady stealing and she goes, oh, boo, boo, boo. Uh, you know, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. So she paid for it. What did she do? She went to the store down the street, got a cash refund and stole about three pairs of shoes from that one. So, you know, if we started actually making people do how it says to do biblically, I think we would stop a lot of crime. Look at Exodus 22, two through six. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm sorry. I told that story. I gotta go faster. Okay, look at this. Uh, if a thief is found uh, breaking up, he's smitten that he dies, no blood will be shed for him. And if the sun is risen on him, there shall be blood shed for him. And he has to make full restitution. And if he has nothing, guess what? He's sold for his theft and he has to work for six years until the next shmita year. And he has to pay off his debt. And here, if a thief is found with something in his hand that's alive, an ox, an ox, or a sheep, he has to restore double. And again, you see underlined, he has to make restitution. And then at the very last part, surely shall make restitution. Okay, so guess what? People steal. They owe money. They have to work for others to pay off debt for the money that they've swindled. But when the problems and injustices of life are dealt with in the Torah manner, the imperfect world gets a little closer to perfection. But what's amazing is all through here, it says they have to make restitution. They have to make restitution. Ephesians 4.28, let him that stole steal no more, but let him labor working with his hands that which is good that he may have to give to him that needs. We're to work in order to give to others. It's not all about ourselves. Look at Luke 19, eight. Zacchaeus stood and said, Lord, behold, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore him how many fold? Fourfold. Exodus 22, 14. If someone borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he has to make what? No, I don't. Tor's done away with. Uh, that doesn't make sense, does it? Nor in the Ten Commandments does it talk about making full restitution. Uh, Exodus 22, 22 through 24. You shall not afflict a widow or the fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will wax hot and I'm going to kill you with the sword and your wife shall be widows and your children will be fatherless. Wow. Why is that? The orphan and the widow can't defend themselves. Okay. Now look at Exodus 22, 26 and 27. If you at all take your neighbor's raiment as a pledge, you have to deliver to him that by the time the sun goes down. For that is his covering. It's his raiment for his skin, wherein he shall sleep. And then it shall come to pass when he cries to me, I'm going to hear for I am gracious. Wow, this is important. You know, Wow, you have to take care of them. Look at Exodus 23, 1 and 2. You shall not spread fake news. That's what it says. Don't spread a false report. Okay, and look at this concerning the court system. Don't join hand with the wicked to be a malicious witness. Don't follow a crowd to do evil. Don't testify in court to side with the multitude to pervert justice. Wow. One of the things that's important here, the rule of following the majority and democracy, I don't know, the church of Laodicea, you, you all familiar with the church of Laodicea? Do you know what Laodicea means? Democracy. That's literally what it means. Let the people decide. Let the people rule. Well, the rule of following the majority is only relevant when one is unsure of what the truth is. Okay, but when there is no doubt, no amount of people with their opinions can change the truth. Uh, Exodus 23, seven, keep yourself far away from fake news. 
Exodus 23, 8, don't take a bribe. A bribe blinds those who have sight and perverts the words of the righteous. So here we, we look at the Ten Commandments uh, and nowhere does it say don't take bribes. Nowhere does it say don't be mean. Uh, nowhere does it say don't be selfish. The, the whole purpose of what God is telling us that this is the kind of people he wants us to be. Uh, that's why in Exodus 23, 10 and 11, it talks about the Shemitah cycle and the six years you sow your land and then the seventh year you rest. And the reason why is so the poor of your people can eat and what they leave the beasts of the field also get to eat. Nowhere is that in the 10 commandments that you have to be kind to widows and orphans and the poor. But here we see that. But if you separate the civil laws from religious law, you're, or a God who's making these civil laws, you're up to able to make up your own. Exodus 23, 14 through 17 basically says that three times you have to keep the feast. No one is to come empty handed. And it talks about the feast of ingathering at the end of the year. That is the feast of tabernacles. Guess what? That tells you it is still the end of the year. When he creates the new calendar with the first month being Nisan, it doesn't replace this calendar because this is going on at the same time. And the feast of booths is called the end of the year harvest. So you have more than one calendar. You got a religious calendar and you have a civil calendar. Uh, and Exodus 23, 19, don't see the kid in his mother's milk. Uh, the principle of this is that the very substance that gave life to the animal, its mother's milk shouldn't be used to take its life at the moment of its death. Uh, it has nothing to do with not eating cheeseburgers, okay? Uh, Exodus 23, 20 and 21. If you remember Abraham, when the angels appeared to him and one of them was the Lord, he gave them meat and milk at the same time. Now I've had a Jew argue with me, well, he separated a couple of hours, gave the meat first and the milk a couple hours later. Well, it was so hot in the desert. If you let milk sit for three hours out in the desert with no refrigeration, they ain't gonna want the milk. So they served it at the same time. Okay, almost done. A couple of quick verses. Uh, Exodus 23, 20 and 21 is an amazing verse. It says, I will send an angel, which also can mean messenger. It doesn't have to be an angel with wings. Okay, he, I'm gonna send a messenger before you to keep you in what? And what were Messiah's disciples called? Followers of the way. And he's gonna bring you to the place which I have prepared. And it says, obey his voice. It says, for he will not pardon your transgressions. What human being has the authority to pardon your transgression? There isn't any. And it says, my name is in him, not just on him, in him. So Yeshua, God's messenger has gone before us. He also said, I am the way. And he says, I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. Like the bridegroom goes away from the bride after the betrothal. So here we have this angel or messenger who has the ability to forgive sin, which no angel even has the authority to do. And it also doesn't say he comes in my name, but my name is in him. Uh, Exodus 23, 22 goes on to say, carefully obey his voice. Exodus 23, 25, 27, it says, you shall serve the Lord your God and he will bless your bread, your water. Let me just explain the Hebrew grammar here. What's fascinating, when it says you shall serve the Lord, it's a collective, it's plural. All of you shall serve the Lord. But when it says he will bless your bread, that's individual, that's your bread. So as the group, cooperates together, the individuals get individually blessed. Why it's important everyone works together and not fight one another. Exodus 23, uh, let me go down to Exodus 24, one through three. Moses came, I'm going to the underlying part. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the what? Mishpatim. And the people, that's plural, answered with one voice, that's singular, and said all the words which the Lord has said, we, what, will, we're gonna do it. We're not just gonna believe it. Just believing what God said doesn't get you into heaven. A lot of Christians think that all we have to do is believe, tap our shoes three times like on Wizard of Oz and spin around and say a few words and you're in. It doesn't work that way. 
Now, which came first? God gave Moses the stone tablets or did Moses write all the laws in a book? Moses wrote all the laws in a book long before God gave the Ten Commandments. And you see that in Exodus 24, 4 through 8 where Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Then he rose up early, built an altar, had 12 pillars. They did burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then it says, they took the book of the covenant. He read it in the audience of all the people. And again, they said all uh, to all that the Lord has said, will do and be obedient. Uh, and then in Exodus 24, God says, come on up to the Mount. So with that said, it's time to rock and roll break time. Let's stand. And then we're going to come back and we're going to look at the letter Lamed. But I just wanted to give you why English is not always the best translation. Let's pray. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we thank you. We love you. We're so glad for everything you've done for us. And as we enter uh, into this break and also in the following time of worship, I pray you would touch all of our hearts. Father, this message is your message. It's not my message. It's not our message. It's your message to the world. So I so thank you for all of those who are live streaming all around the world and all of those who are here locally who are investing into the kingdom of God and being a light to the nation. And I just thank you for all those who give into this uh, ministry of yours. It's not our ministry. It's your ministry. And I'm just so thankful for all those who want to be a part of it and pray you bless them individually even as they become part of the group and taking your tour to the nations. In Yeshua's name, amen. Take a break. Oh, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. So are you ready? Buckled up. How many of you could speak for 45 minutes on the letter R? <laughs> well, I'm going to speak a while on one Hebrew letter, and it is the Hebrew letter Lamed. I love Lamed. Uh, it's in the ancient picture language. Like I said, if you look on your computer, you have different fonts. When Moses used that letter, it was like a shepherd's staff that is used to get a sheep out of the ditch. Uh, being the shepherd's staff, it also represents uh, authority. If you have a staff, you have authority, you have control. Uh, so it's very important uh, to realize these things as well as knowing that the Lamed is the 12th letter, but the numerical value is 30, okay? It's the 12th Hebrew letter. Uh, the first 10 letters are all one through 10, and then the Kaf is 20, Lamed is 30. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this letter. Uh, it represents also like a cattle goad to prod someone along. How many of us sometimes have someone in our, an authority kind of prodding us along? Keep going, come on, we gotta get this done. Well, in Judges chapter three, verse 31, it talks about the judges and it says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines, 600 men with an ox goad. And so here, that word is Lamed. And so here we have this ox goat and he, this, this guy slew 600 Philistines with his ox goat. Now in Acts 26, 14, after Rabbi Shaul fell to the ground when the Lord appeared to him, he says, I heard a voice speaking to me in what language? And who was speaking to him? God, Yeshua. And he's speaking from where? Heaven. What does this tell you? The heavenly language is Hebrew. Hello. It doesn't say he was speaking in the Aramaic tongue. It doesn't say he was speaking in English. He was speaking in 
Hebrew. And he said, Shaul, Shaul, why are you persecuting me? It hurts for you to kick against the what? Ox goats, the lamed. He's rebelling against authority. See, the whole concept of the ox goats, why are you kicking against the goats? In other words, he didn't realize it, but he was going against authority. Now, what's fascinating about uh, the Lamed, how many of you have heard of Elohim? Well, El is short of Elohim. The Aleph, if you remember, is an ox, and the Lamed is the shepherd's staff. So God is the first authority, Aleph is the first letter, and a strong authority. You can even see that with, in the picture language. Now, the Lamed is the 12th letter, has a numerical value of 30. Well, guess what? The number 30 represents the perfection of divine order, being three times 10. So what's fascinating, here it is, the number 30. Look at this. In Genesis 41, verse 46, Joseph was how old? He was 30. It says he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And what happens? He's given a llama. He's given authority. And it is the number 30. If we look at Numbers chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Take the sum of the sons of Kohath from among the sons of Levi, their families, by the house of their fathers, from 30 years old, upward even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. You cannot do the tabernacle or the temple service until you were 30 years old. Then you have the authority to work. Look at this. In 2 Samuel 5, 4, how old was David when he began to reign? He was 30. Luke 3, 23, Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age. Now look at Luke 2.42. And when Yeshua was 12 years old, he went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. Wow. Lamed is the 12th letter. And it has the miracle value of 30. And so here we see Yeshua at 12 years old having authority, which was even astounding to the priests. Listen to this in Luke 2.46. It came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So here he is at 12 years old. He's the teacher of teachers. And that's why the 12th letter is the Lamed and he's the shepherd with the authority and he has the authority to teach and look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 19 through 21. Indeed, O people in Zion, dwellers of Jerusalem, you shall not have cause to weep. He will grant you his favor at the sound of your cry. He will respond as soon as he hears it. My Lord will provide for you meager bread and scant water. And look at this, then your teacher will no more be ignored, but your eyes will watch your teacher. And whenever you devote or deviate to the right or to the left, your ears will heed the command from behind you. This is the road, follow it. Lamed means teacher. And guess what? It also means to learn. Even teachers need to learn so they can work on their teaching. And here the Lamed is the 12th letter and you're 30 years old when you can really take the role of a teacher. And what do we see? Yeshua has 12 disciples. In Israel, there are 12 tribes. The 12 disciples are known as Talmudim. This is where you get the word Talmud from, which means to study and to learn. And you can see the L or the Lamed uh, by looking at the English that it is right in the middle of that. Now in Deuteronomy, Chapter 5, in verse 1, Moses calls all of Israel and he says to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the judgments. And what's the Hebrew word for judgments? Mishpatim, which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep them and do them. And the word learn there is Lamed. 
So here we see Lamed means to teach and it also means to learn. And I think this is why God says you have to be like little kids. Little kids know they have a lot to learn. It's not until they're teenagers they know it all. But in the meantime, you know, God wants us to be willing to be taught and not think we know it all. In Deuteronomy 6 verse 1, it says, Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the mishpatim, the judgments, which the Lord your God commanded to do what? Teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess. Well, guess what? The word for teach there is lamed. So lamed can mean teach. Lamed can mean learn. Now, when we looked at the letter yud, we saw that the letter yud means a closed hand, like a fist. It represents a deed or a work that you've done. And then we saw how the letter kof represented the open hand. All right? Well, the Lamed is the tallest of all the letters, and you can see it's above the line there uh, when you're looking at the font as you go across. And so it stands also at the center. So the Lamed is the heart of the Hebrew alphabet. It's at the center. So when you see the 22 letters, you see Lamed is right in the middle. It is at the heart uh, of the alphabet, so it's compared to a watchtower. So the, the watchtower goes high above, it has the light, and it is looking everywhere. It's like a watchtower or a lighthouse. In, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16, it says, you are the light of the world. A city that's set in the hill can't be hit. Men don't light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. And then it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works and glorify you. No, and glorify your Father in heaven. Too many people want to do all these good works that they may be glorified. God says, no, I want you to do all these good works to glorify me. You're not to be the center of attention. But the good works are those things that we're doing, and as we do them, we become lights, like a watchtower. One of the interesting things, as it raises above the clouds, does anyone know this word? Tefillah! That is prayer. And prayer rises above the clouds. And so think of the Lamed as something that is arriving above the clouds. It's the connection from earth to heaven and heaven to earth. Now, here's what's fascinating. It says, uh, let me see. We know from Jeremiah that God says he's looking and he's watching over his word to perform it or to do it. Well, the fascinating thing about this letter, Lama, that's connecting heaven to earth, it's not only likened uh, to a watchtower, uh, it's made up of two letters. It's made up, they say, of a cough and a lamed. Here, let me go back a second, see what I got here. Okay, if you look at this, you can see the cough, and then on the top, the stack looks like a vav. And so they say a cough or the Lamed is made up of two letters. Kof has a numerical value of 20, Vav is six, together that's 26, which also equals the name of God, the uh, Tetragrammaton. Now, what's fascinating about that is you can think of the Lamed with the Kof being an open hand, and then on top of it is a flame as if our good deeds provide the platform that brings light to the world in giving glory to God. So the, the Vav is like man, because we're Vav, we're made on the sixth day, and we're to do our good deeds, and it's supposed to have people look toward the heavens. So the letter was Vav was also represents man, and the cough is God's hand. That also teaches us, look at 1 Peter 5, 6. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So here we have the cough is the hand, the open hand of God. And then he will exalt you like the 
fire going, or the Shekinah going up into heaven. Now, the thing is this, in Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, Yeshua said to them, you err, you don't know the scriptures, nor the power of God. So you have two things. You have the scriptures and you have the power of God. Now, a lot of Christians claim to walk in the power of God, but they don't know the scriptures. And then there's a lot of people who know the scriptures, but they know nothing of the power of God. We got to have both. God says you have to know the scriptures and the power of God. You can't do without them. Now, here's what's fascinating. <clears throat> Let's look at Matthew 5.13. God says we are also what? The salt of the earth. Okay. Well, here's salt. Okay. And it is N-A-C-L. The N-A is the sodium. And what happens if you put sodium in water? It's not good. It's very bad. Okay. Now, the C-L is chloride. All right. And so you have these two elements coming together. And guess what? Those two elements coming together become is salt. By themselves, they're not good. But when combined, it is good. So salt is sodium chloride made up of sodium and chloride. Sodium in water explodes. So when you neglect God's word, you become explosive. All right. There's a saying that knowledge, head knowledge, without power you dry up. Power, without knowledge, you blow up. With knowledge and power, you grow up. Okay, so that's what we need to do. We can't just know the scriptures and not have the power of God. We can't have the power of God and not know the scriptures. It's a combination. It only works when it's combined. <clears throat> In Luke 6, 45b, it says, out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Well, you know what's interesting about that? The last letter of the Torah. Who can tell me what the last letter of the Torah is? How about the last word? The last word is Israel. So what's the last letter? Lamed. All right. What's the first word of the Torah? Bereshit. Bereshit. And what's the first letter? Bait. So if you take the Torah as it's written out in one big long line and you bring the last letter together with the first letter and you put a clasp on it, what do you have at the, the lamed and the bait, which is lev or heart? And so the whole Torah is God's heart. Now, the lamed meaning Authority and control represents God. So God is the Lama who is right like the watchtower with the lighthouse who's watching everything that's going on. Now, here's the thing I want you to notice. It says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, what? When God spoke creation that came from his heart, all of the Torah commands came from his heart. Moses wasn't the author of the Torah. God was the author of the Torah. Moses was the, was the scribe writing it. So again, when we do away with Torah, we're doing away with God's heart. That's another way of looking at it. Because Torah was spoken from the very heart of God. So here we have the Lamed at the center of the alphabet. Again, it's considered the heart. Since Lamed is the tallest and has the central position, it is said to represent the king of kings. Well, if you look at that word I have underlined and you go this direction, you have Mem Lamed Kof, which spells Melech or king. So right at the center of the Hebrew alphabet, you have the very word king, and he is the king of kings. 
Now, as I said, the meaning of the word, because every Hebrew letter is also a word, and the meaning of the word uh, lamed means to goad or prod along, right? As a shepherd would prod cattle along. And uh, the, like I said, the, the center, uh, the word lamed, the root means to learn or to teach. Guess where the first time it is used in the scripture? It's in Deuteronomy chapter four, verse one and two, where it says, now Israel, listen or shma to the statutes and judgments which I teach to you to observe. So here's the first time that it occurs. And it says that you may what? Live and go in and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. And then he says, don't you be adding to it. Don't be taking from it that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, I command you. Okay, so some groups want to add to the word of God. Other groups want to take away from the word of God. Uh, but that is not what we're supposed to do. We see here in the context that the first time it is used, it's in the context of learning God's Torah, the source of everything that's worth being taught. And, but the other thing is this, this is an important statement. Since the letter Lamed is the heart of the alphabet and the very word for heart begins with the letter Lamed and Lamed means to learn, we see learning is for, more for the heart than the head. Often we learn for the head. No, we need to learn for the heart. Now here's an interesting question. Uh, let me go here. Yeah, here we ha I have Israel and Breshit, and you put the last letter of the Torah with the first letter of the Torah, you get Lev, which is heart. But if you remember, the Lamed, okay, uh, represents the king. Bait represents the house. So the very word heart, Lev, is what is in the king's house. That's what we have to have in the king's house is all of the Torah and it's love. Now, let me ask you something. Let me show you this picture. Here's a desert. Why did Israel have to wander through the desert for 40 years? I think they had 42 different spots they camped. Why didn't God just put them in one spot and let them stay there for the 40 years? What was the purpose of having to pack and get up and go to the next location? and unpack, and then get up and go to another location. Well, guess what it has been said? What was the reason for them to have to take 42 journeys in 40 years? That's like every, how many of you like moving? How about 40 times in 40 years? Oh, oh. Well, they say the reason why God had them move to a different place was because everywhere the ark went, it turned into an oasis. When they settled there, the area where the ark was turned into a beautiful garden. And so the purpose of the Jewish people's travels in the desert was to transform the desert into a garden to bring godliness into a desert place. And each and every one of the Jews encampments became not only a spiritual, but a literal garden. And this became a lesson and a guidepost for the Jewish people and all their future exiles. God was informing them throughout history, you will have to travel. You'll trek from country to country to country, but everywhere you go, you must take the ark of God with you, ushering godliness to that area. I mean, that is just incredible. And so it's like the Jews are scattered in the whole world and they're to take godliness with them and turn a place into the garden everywhere they go and have the ark of God with them. I thought that was pretty cool. The very word Israel moves What's the first letter of Israel? Okay, the Yod, the smallest letter. And what's the last letter of Israel? The Lamed. And so what do we see? 
uh, we see that in the name of Israel, it moves from the smallest letter to the largest letter, suggesting Israel is dependent upon God as well as the direction of their destiny, where they're going. They go from being the smallest of the nations, they're going to be the largest of the nations at the end of time. Now, in Exodus 19.5, look at this letter, Lamed. This is in every Torah scroll, but it's not in your English Bibles. Here is a word, kila, and look at that lamed. Look how it is up at the top. This happens in Exodus 19.5, where God says, um, now, therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people of the earth. Uh, let's see. Am I... Let me see. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Genesis 27:30. In Genesis 27:30, that's where I was. God uh, was. Remember when Jacob and Esau were both blessed by Isaac. When they were both blessed by Isaac, you see God's name is mentioned in the blessing over Jacob, but God's name was not mentioned in the blessing over Esau. This word, Kela, is mentioned in the blessing. And what you see is the bucket of blessing coming from heaven down to earth. <clears throat> in Genesis 27, 30, it came to pass as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob. That's the word finished. When he finished blessing Jacob, and that's the bucket of heaven that is seen pouring down upon Jacob. Okay? Now, in Exodus 19, 5, going back there, here the name of Israel begins with the letter U, the smallest letter, and then it ends with the largest letter, Lamed, as Israel progresses from being the most unknown nation to now the nation that's known all over the world. Okay, let's see. Oh, wow. Okay, let's jump down to Lamentations 1, 10 through 12. We're almost done. Let me bring this up. Anyone know this word? Lo means no. Lo is no. Well, guess what? In Lamentations 1, 10 through 12, the adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things. She has seen that the heathen entered to her sanctuary, whom you did command that they should not enter into the congregation. And all of her people are sighing. They're looking for bread. Now remember, Lamentations is when the temple is being destroyed and Jerusalem is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. And they've given their pleasant things for me to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Well, that word nothing or no is the word low. But there's a difference. What happens, the lamed is made extra large. And the yud is made extra small. It's not normal font size. And this particular... Uh, place. Let me look at where I'm at. Okay. And they're saying that this indicates that when Zion went into is exile, it had reached the lowest point among the nations and its position as an authority was drastically reduced. And here is uh, the, that word low also where the lamed is shrunk. It's made real small. And that's because their authority was made small. And then in uh, Deuteronomy 29, verse 26 through 28, it says, they went, Israel went and served other gods, worshiped them whom they, gods they didn't know, who we had not given to them. And that says the anger of the Lord was kindled against his land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in his book. And the Lord rooted them out. When you root something out, you don't just mow over it. You get to the roots and pull it out. And then it says, uh, he rooted them out of their land in anger, in wrath, in great indignation, and cast them into another land. This is the phrase, and cast them. And notice how the lamed is so big. It's making some kind of a point. Well, the oversized lamed in this verse shows God will use this ejection from the land to teach, because the lamed means teach, to teach them. Yet, he will still be watching over them while they are scattered, and he will bring them back to their land in the end of days when he will be revealed as the Lamed, the king of kings. So it's like the shepherd's staff. Not only will he cast them out, but he's going to bring them back. 
at the same time. That's his promise. And we see in Zechariah 14, 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, there'll be one Lord and his name one, and king is represented by the Lamed. So God, like the king Lamed, was to be at the center of Israel. But they did not want a king to reign over them. They even told God that when Samuel was trying to find a king for them. We don't want God to reign over us. We want a king like all the nations have. Therefore, they limited the Holy One of Israel. And so they cast God out. And so God cast them out. Do you know what day it was when they told God that they did not want him to reign over them? Do you know what it was on the calendar? Sinai when God came down and gave them the Torah, became their king, was on Shavuot, Pentecost. It was on Shavuot that they said, we don't want God to reign over us. The very same day they made the wedding covenant. Can you imagine whether you get a divorce, but to get the divorce on the day you were married? Well, this is what happened. Okay, Proverbs uh, oh, I have here another layer of meaning for the enlarged Lamed would be he cast them out so they could teach the nations the belief in one God who is king over all the earth when they, you know, until they return. Now, we've got a couple of verses. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. And the Hebrew word for tongue begins with the letter Lamed. It's Lashon. They talk about Lashon Hara, which is the evil tongue or evil speech. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, yeah. In the ancient picture language, this is how uh, Moses would have probably written it. You see the Lamed, the Shin, the Vav, and the Nun there, uh, which is uh, kind of like the authority is being destroyed, you know, that's attached to life. And that's what the devil wants us to do. It also says basically that life and death are in the power of what? The tongue. The noon is life. The vav is in. The shin is, represents uh, to devour. And so life and death are in the power of the tongue. And that's the Hebrew word for tongue. But here's the thing. We also see in Proverbs 18, 8, the words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Our tongue can wound. Any ever, anyone ever here been wounded by someone's tongue? You know what I'm talking about. Proverbs 15, 31, the ear that hears reproof of life abides among the wise. And so the letter Lamed, which represents the tongue also, it also represents control. Remember, Lamed represents control and authority. What do we have to have control and authority over? The tongue. James 1, 26, if anyone among you seems religious and he does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart and this man's religion is vain. Now, Here's the last one. Anyone know that word up at the top? You know the hay, and now you know the lamed. That is hallel, as in hallelujah. Hallel means to praise. What are we supposed to be doing with our tongue? Praising. And look at Revelation 5, 9 to 10. They sang a new song saying, you're worthy to take the book and open the seals. You were slain, redeemed to us. Uh, to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people and nation, and has made us into our God, kings and priests, and we will reign on the earth. And so basically what we're to do, that we, are need, we need to reveal the tongue of tongues, or praise is to be from every nation. Amen? With that said, let's stand. And let's pray. And next week we'll look at the letter Mem. Avino Mulcano, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for all that you are doing in our lives. You're teaching us to watch our tongue. You're teaching us about the Lama. You are the King of Kings. And we know your heart is your word because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So when we look at your Torah, let us not break it apart into little bits, civil, religious. We're going to keep it all together and it's all telling us about you and your character and who you are. So I pray, Lord, that we begin to understand the importance of the Torah and see how all of the New Testament is founded upon the Torah. You can't have a roof without a foundation or walls. It's one house. 
And so, Father, uh, your Torah is one word and one law, and we thank you for it. And we just pray, Lord, that you would bless your people, even as Moses told Aaron to bless them in this manner. Ivarekaka Adonai ve'ishmareka, Ya'er Adonai panavileka vihuneka, Isa Adonai panavileka v'asem, Laka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In that mighty name, Ayah, Asher, Ayah.